Hi, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Mo. Uh, I have the pleasure to invite a digital new media artist, Khan or John or... Yeah, it's, it's actually John. It's a Turkish name. Uh, it's pronounced just like J-O-N in English, you know. So who you are, what you do, can I introduce uh, yourself a little bit? Uh, my name is John Büyük Berber. I'm an independent uh, digital artist, a visual artist, or a media artist, whatever you call it. Everybody calls me something different depending on when they met me. For some people, I'm a VR artist. For some other people, I'm a projection mapping guy. For some other people, I'm a 3D artist. So, But I like calling myself an independent visual artist who works with mostly digital media, but there are also physical components as well. My work is mostly is an exploration of the relationship between digital and physical spaces. So I like understanding that relationship better, how they overlap, how they intersect, uh, what can we transfer from a physical space into uh, a digital space, or what, how can we bring digital spaces into physical spaces. So for that, I use and experiment with different type of media to bridge that gap between t the two. And I usually create uh, immersive audiovisual experiences, whether it is a room full of projectors or an architectural space using LED screens or a VR headset, uh, AR, 3D printing. So I experiment with all kinds of new media to explore that relationship between. How did you become a new media artist? People don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, today I want to try new media art. It's, it's such a niche. Yeah, yeah. I was always interested in art and technology, art and science at the same time from my earliest memories. You know, I always wanted to become an artist and a scientist at the same time or whether one of these or not. So I have a background in uh, physics and design and art and technology. My earliest amateur works started in my high school days. This goes back to early 2000s. When I had my first uh, personal computer, I started to experiment with software, video editing. I was a huge, huge uh, science fiction fan. And uh, I started mimicking the visual effects of the, those sci-fi movies. So that led me to 3D animation softwares, compositing, the concept of keyframing, for instance which allows creating animations. I learned that during those high school days. Um, I started to do amateur work. I was discovered online in the earliest days of YouTube. Uh, so I, I had my first gigs as a, you know, semi-professional as a visual effects artist, uh, working for movies and music videos and advertisements in the uh, Turkey's Istanbul media sector. Uh, and I was studying physics at the same time. So there was a art and tech thing going on along with my science interests. But after those earliest days of like working three years in the media industry, I decided, okay, this is what I love. I need to learn more about this. And I, I started studying in a visual communication design. And in that school, we had a very nice modern art museum. We had, you know, uh, lots of uh, media art exhibitions coming from Germany, Austria. Uh, and that's when I realized, okay, I can use the same techniques, but I this shouldn't be for a movie or a music video. This can be an art form in itself. And I can uh, showcase these digital works in, in a gallery or in a museum. That's when I was, you know, exposed to the media art scene. And after that, I had a master's in art and technology in San Francisco. It's also a great cultural hub as an intersection of the art scene, its historical context, and also the hub, the center for the, all the technological developments at the moment. So being there also helped me a lot to have an early access to new technologies, being surrounded by a community of people of similar minds. So that's basically the story in a nutshell. Nice. A few people actually have this background of both. I see more and more uh, today, there are artists who have this idea that they want to create a vision of something, but they lack the knowledge 
to manipulate Houdini or other softwares, and they just want other technicians, let's say uh, VFX artists, or even AI, to carry out their idea. Uh, would you say the, the core of new media art work is the technique or is the idea? Or you think it's not possible to separate? Yeah, I think it's not possible to separate. You know, everybody has their own relationship with technology and their artistic approach, you know, so it's it's hard to really categorize it. Uh, I, I can talk about my practice. For me, uh, the idea, the concept, the aesthetic, artistic exploration goes along at the same time with the media exploration, because I, I, I think this is one of the reasons that we call it a media art. We could call it contemporary art. We can just call it art or whatever, you know, like I don't, I don't really care about those uh, ca categorizations, but for me, I love exploring a new technology, how we can approach it, what kind of expression it, it would bring, what is the difference of this, that particular media from the previous other uh, medias. For instance, VR, virtual reality, is a great new frontier and it comes with its own uh, aesthetics, its own approach. It's, it's kind of like an expanded cinema, but it's different because you are a fr you have a first person pr perspective. So th the whole approach, the whole uh, idea of storytelling or tailoring an experience changes with the media, you know. I think some of the best work uh, of the media art comes from utilizing the specific media in its own way so that it, it becomes its own unique expression. I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. Sure. It's maybe just me, but I feel that new media artists are limited by the technological development of others. I mean, the new media artists didn't invent VR glasses, right? So right. you kind of uh, take the bread crumble falling from the great brilliant minds in science, and then you turn it into something wonderful. It's not not less important, but it is in the uh, secondary kind of um, space that is not really, really avant-garde. This is my thinking. Contradict me, come on. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a, a technological innovation comes with own limitations or own framings. So that is true that in a way we are limited by this recent technological stage or evolution. But at the same time, uh, I had really nice experiences with technologies or software companies that artists are actually usually, you know, uh, a part of that whole innovation process as well. Because at the end, you have a certain technology, but you need content uh, to uh, reach out to people with that technology. Otherwise, it's just a black screen. You know, it doesn't if it doesn't show anything specific or if it doesn't showcase the what kind of beauty it can reveal then it's it's kind of useless so uh, a good technology always needs good art with it i think i believe some companies really value an artist or, or a creator's perspective so that they can use their tools or devices better so that those devices or tools uh, can allow you to bring the best of your art to the world you know True, because after all, new media artists are also the clients and users of those technology. Right. And as a client, you also have a certain power to choose, to reject, to endorse, and to help with the marketing, right? You, you, word of mouth, you're basically a media in their space to get the word around, to promote and steer the technology into a certain direction. I want to mention one thing. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I was in London attending a conference, and they were talking about small technology. I was in shock. They're like, oh, we need to send smaller photos because larger photo is taking too much space. Taking server space means take energy, take electricity, take the actual rare earth metal resources. So we should make everything smaller. You know, it's like minimalism in digital space, in art space. And I didn't get the point at first because, I mean, coming from uh, like 
Asian culture is more towards the American culture. We want bigger, better, faster. We want the glory. And in Europe, it seems like the movement is the opposite. What do you think? You want the bigger or you want the, the more ecological or, or safer? Or how do you see this? Yeah, I, I think it all depends on the efficiency, you know, like an efficient or smart product. I mean, when it's necessary or more efficient to use a sh you know, smaller file or smaller technology, it is wise to do that. But uh, when you prefer, for instance, Christopher Nolan is a great director. He knows uh, with his use of the best camera technologies possible. He works with 70 millimeters, uh, you know, film, and he l uses IMAX cameras, which are really not that easy to use, giant cameras, but his, he has a vision to capture the best picture possible. So for his vision, he needs to work with the best, the biggest or largest possible. But for instance, if we're just sending each other a picture on WhatsApp, maybe it doesn't really need that much bandwidth or storage space or whatever. So I think it all comes to efficiency. We need to be careful about if this routine tasks we do, if they uh, use less energy, I think that's good. But if we need to light up something for a short amount of time for the best experience possible, I think we, we have to be able to do that too. <laughs> Nice, yeah. Thinking about the, the outcome, your vision, and also the customer experience, because your viewers, mm. um, to reach out to them, to pass through the message, obviously, is the whole point of putting out your art out there for people to see. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if they, it's all pixelated, they can't see nothing, obviously. You know, like, like now we are recording the wave files, highest quality possible to have a better audio, so... I know it's not efficient in a way, but I want to do the extra miles and the earth is taking a two, but that's, <laughs> that's another <laughs> story. Right now. How do you uh, get into the world of new media art? Did you apply for a special program or a special kind of festival? Or what are the biggest milestones that made you a professional um, emerging, even we can say mid-career, but you're young, you're like, my age, so usually we would say, you know, mid career, mid age, you know. <laughs> but uh, would you call yourself a successful new media artist? How did you get yeah. there? I mean, until a certain point, you are always known as a young artist. You know, like it, it has a very wide range of ages <laughs> in it. Like I said, everybody has their own path. There is no right way to do it. But uh, I was kind of uh, fortunate to have certain things to have certain things aligned in my life first of all my passion became my job so it doesn't feel like a job so i i and that's a big thing i think that you know we need to feel fortunate if we have a certain constellation like that like working in a professional environment or a studio for a while to understand the pipelines better also the industry better uh, being in an art school really helps also exposing my work on you know social media and creating my own network uh, through that so I mean p possibly today sharing your work is one of the most important things that you can do uh, because you don't know who is watching you don't know where can it go uh, it always amazed me uh, the, the kind of uh, opportunities arrived through that. Uh, I'm always surprised. Oh, I, I didn't even imagine, you know, this such people would be interested in this type of work or, or this client or this company or, you know, this gallery or this festival. So the, the, just sharing is important. But also in your early days, 100% you need to apply for residencies you know exhibitions galleries festivals and i did that um so some of those exhibitions and festivals also exposes you to newer audiences to new curators 
after a while, I think you find your own momentum and if you find your own rhythm, you, you know, develop your own audience and after a while it just begins to happen naturally. You know, you get invited to some things or you get invited to uh, a certain gallery or exhibition, you know. So uh, right now I'm, I'm lucky that things happen now naturally, unfold naturally for me. Mm. Imagine if I'm a, a young person, I mean, younger than I am, a 25 year old coming out <laughs> of college. I did film school, so I know a bit cool. of, uh, you know, visual effects and stuff. Not like I'm very good at it, but I have the idea and necessary tools and I want to become a new media artist. Let's say uh, I would like to approach a gallery, um, art festival, and maybe work with the public sector that is uh, foundations or other kind of sponsored um, research and development projects. Out of the three road or path, um, what are the kind of intersections? Do they actually have a fight between the careers or what is the uh, ecosystem? What are the dynamics? For example, um, how do I sell my new media art? Because obviously um, it's not like uh, artwork is not as tangible and it's also sometimes too tangible like a huge a humongous installation that is really uncollectible right. so tell me a little bit about uh, your advice to a young person who wants to get into it with this let's say the, the three most uh, yeah. approachable ways it's 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 tough to uh, find the start for me personally studying visual communication design really helps especially media arts is a very visual medium. It doesn't have to be, it can be just very invisible. It can be just sound or concepts, like whatever you choose. But, you know, communication platforms that we're using is mostly visual. Like there's always an interface we're interacting with, even if it's just text or images, like, like there's always a visual component to your communication with your clients or with your, with the galleries or people you are trying to communicate with. So in that sense, visualizing your ideas, I believe it's important. And studying visual communication design helped me with that because I think like I, I can visualize an idea better than I can speak about it or write about it. Because when you visualize something well, for the other people who you are trying to convey the idea, it's easier for them to capture okay, this is how it's going to look like. This is the scale. This is the feel of it. And I got better and better along the way with those kind of pre-visualizations. It became first images, then videos, then better PDF presentations. I think to be able to present your idea is important, uh, whatever you are trying to connect to. In your earlier days, it's important to put the ideas, put the seeds out there, you know, that you feel most comfortable with, you feel most proud of, you know, presenting, or you really enjoy producing that kind of work. It's important to put that out there because people who are interested in your work, in your art, uh, they're going to see those kind of first, those kind of works first. And usually they want a similar thing that you already produced. So it's important to be careful about what kind of ideas you're putting out there. Uh, it might be something that it's really challenging to create or you don't really love the process. That's why I say you need to be careful because you're going to attract similar type of work. Uh, so uh, I think in a way you tailor your own uh, opportunities, your own story, your own destiny with those type of uh, selections in your career. I like when you say to kind of pitch the idea to others, maybe to your uh -huh. audience, maybe to your uh, colleagues who work in the industry, to your peers, you present yourself as the ABC artist, let's say, you know, the Udini <laughs> huge installation artist, or the we are, you know, um, first person um, interactive artist, or I can imagine that is the niche that is your own uh, kind of uh, plot, you are the hero uh, in your hero's journey and you're creating the story. Um, but I also noticed when you talk about the pitching the project, 
It reminds me of many projects I've seen. They are all kind of uh, not finished projects. They are ideas that you go to a gallery, you go to a foundation, you go to a festival, then they sponsor you to make it. So in a way, how do you distinguish yourself with the poodle artist? The poodle artist is is my nickname uh, to the artists who draw other people's poodles. Right. I mean, it's 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 hard. You know, uh, that's that's a developmental process. That it doesn't. You know, everything doesn't happen hundred percent the way you want to be at first. You know, like like any other endeavor in life. You know, you learn about it as you interact with the people with the industry with the you know colleagues like it it is an interactive developmental process and along the way you better understand your preferences what what you're more comfortable with or what do you want to don't what you don't want to do the type of people you don't want to work with or you prefer to working with you know uh, so you got to just get out there and do stuff and collaborate and have failures, you know, have bad clients, good clients, good friends, bad friends. Like you got to live life for a while before you can be sure that, OK, like now I understand uh, what type of artist I am. Now I understand better what type of industry this is. So you got to set your preferences your approach, your aesthetics, uh, along the way, you also build a portfolio. There are pieces that you're more proud of. Those gets the more highlights, you know, in your presentations and stuff. And, and you carve your way with those good and bad experiences. And hopefully if you learn from those experiences, you attract better uh, interactions and opportunities in life. So like there is no way to, First, I need to decide everything. I need to create the persona and like uh, everything needs to be ready. Then I will be presenting myself as an artist. Then I will be exhibiting some, you know, something that's not going to happen. Like you, you gotta, you gotta do stuff, experience things, uh, fail and, and then learn from it so that you, you build your own identity and your own aesthetics and approach. Mm-hmm. I have two questions, one about team, one about money, and sometimes they are kind of uh, interfering with each other. As a new media artist, usually you will need to work with other people, I guess, because um, technology, you don't cover every specialization. When you visualize your work, you might need to work with another a special effect artist or a technician, or even at the production of the pieces, you need uh, some other uh, even workers outside of art that I believe you need to be a good team worker to be a new media artist. Would you agree with that? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in your earlier days, you need to work with people so you can learn from them, see, understand your limitations, see the beyonds of your own abilities and beyond your own uh, talents or cognitive horizon, you know, so what, what are other people doing, you know, how they approach to their own craft? Uh, what do you don't like about it? Or what do you like about it? You know, but, uh, it's it, along the way, I think it's better to become a multidisciplinary person, at least on a basic level, you can de- do most of the things y- you're required to be doing, you know, uh, getting better at documenting your work, getting better at presenting your work, getting better at maybe some like small editing, sound design things, you know, that would normally require maybe another professional. But, you know, if you at least learn the basics, if you at least uh, can create a draft of what you're trying to achieve, I think you can uh, have better collaborations. Uh, You can convey your idea better to your team. And also maybe you're going to find out maybe you can do most of the things that you want to do as a solo artist, you know. Uh, But uh, it's a... yeah, it's a try and fail kind of thing for me to understand that process, but also respecting other people's techniques, under, like I said, understanding your limitations and as asking for help, because sometimes you think that you need the other people more than 
he or she needs you, but sometimes it's not the way it is. Maybe they're looking just someone like you and they, they would love working with you together, collaborating on something. And especially, uh, you know, uh, with the technical technicalities of this type of work, sometimes, you know, some people are more technical and they want to work with an artist or an art director who would think more about the, you know, concepts, the aesthetics of it, the design of it. And sometimes uh, it's vice versa, you know? How is the community of new media artists like? Um, I guess you have like painter friends, they would complain about the competition, one for themselves, him or herself. So there's no collaboration or lack of collaboration compared to let's say film industry, because film industry in the rolling credit, you see thousands of people working on a large scale project, uh, thousands easy, right? So uh, how is the uh, dynamic between like interpersonal relationship in new media art. I think it's just like any other industry. There are all kinds of people. I think one of the things about the internet and like open source communities, like there is, you can find your own community uh, if you look for it, if you search for it. There are lots of documentations about all kinds of new technologies or software or experimental things, especially when they're in their experimental phase and it's open source you can find limitless amount of um, information about it. And some people really like to share their process, you know, their their approach. And, and just like any other industry, there are also people who are very competitive and you're gonna have some competition uh, and you can't really get away from it. You, you need to toughen up and learn to stand your ground and uh, like I said, set your preferences straight. Uh, but I think it's good to have both, like to, to have some supportive friends, to have some more sharing. Uh, I mean, personally too, you got to share something so that other people can learn from you and you can learn from them. But you also got to have a, you know, at least a friendly way of competition in yourself maybe with yourself, so you can develop and get better, you know? It's give and take. You can't just take, take, yeah. take and not give. Totally. Right. Yeah, yeah. But I generally, I find people more supportive and more sharing than they're competitive, competitive in, mm. this, in, in this field or community. Mm, I see. And now I'd like to talk about money. So many... <sighs> younger person they look at new media art they think it's glorious they think it's like the new film industry you know the hollywood in their prime times and they think it's going to be a big opportunity to make money and even i had some business school friends um, they have no idea what is art what is new media art but they see we are they see ai generated imagery and they think oh it's my opportunity to get in there to get some quick cash and get out of it but I've been telling them this is not how it works. But so how is the money situation going on in this field? I mean, art in general is a high risk, high gain industry. You know, a lot of people fail along the way. I mean, it's not something you can advise to everyone, you know, as a career to follow, you know, you need to have certain qualities in you. If your intention is right, if you have some sort of talent and interest in the field and and also some courage to face those challenges and have a more unpredictable path but also you enjoy the process and you learn from it then you, i believe you can do it but also in terms of like the economics of it uh, if you want a long lasting career like if that's your intention i don't think the short term game is gonna work because like uh, and you can do it, you know, there are some people who benefits from a boom in a new technology, you, you know, they can make some, for instance, NFTs, like it, it was like a great, perfect moment to make quick cash for lots of fellows. But I, I don't know if they're going to continue creating art or like I said, you, you attract the type of people uh, that, that, that you are, you know, so if you just pursue that kind of path and it's just about 
making money in the short term and not really giving or not really caring about a long lasting career, then those kind of people are going to find you and they become your peers and friends. And I don't know that kind of uh, community would guide you to a long term happiness. It, it, it's a personal preference for everyone. And if you believe in it, if you really love what you're doing, I think over time it's rewarding. I, I remember like some of the musicians that I've been following in my teenage years, like I, I, I got this idea of like, if you're, if you can make a living through your art and not have a side job or side gig, then you made it as an artist, you know? So it doesn't matter. Do you, do you have side gigs? <laughs> Yeah, I, I can make a living through my art. I feel fortunate. Ah. Yeah, yeah. So I can say it's a modest life uh, and everybody's understanding of modesty is different also. But uh, I, I believe if you can make a living through your own creations, that's a win. Yes, you build your own lifestyle. You are your own boss. You answer to no one and create things, create visions that people you know share with. That's, yes, that's a very rewarding career indeed. And I think autonomy and independence is is invaluable. You know, you can't put a price on it. I mean, you can be a tech billionaire, but surrounded by, you know, nets of necessities and, you know, like terrible people and like a stressful life. Like being an independent autonomous creator, I think it's, you can, you, it's invaluable. And can you share with us some of the uh, milestones that you had in your career that really made you autonomous? Autonomous, autonomous yeah, like the uh, cars. <laughs> yes, that made you uh, autonomous, successful, and uh, uh, basically like made you who you are. What are the key events, key people, key works, projects, or even other artists who made you who you are today? There are infinite amount of people who contributed to all that I could do, you know, so uh, it's a long list for sure, starting with parents, friends, teachers, like it's a long list, but like there are some very obvious turning points. The most important recent one was getting a Fulbright scholarship from United States State Department because it allowed me to pursue my master's in San Francisco and not think about anything else in those several years so that I could just focus on my art, have a studio at SFAI and have supporting colleagues and teachers and just develop my own art. Those two years were really magical and I, I founded a lot of the ideas that I'm, in, I'm pursuing right now in those two years. Like you can see very clearly the aesthetic approach, the concepts, the media uh, experimentation, the seeds are in that process. Another, I think, important experience was Autodesk Pier 9 artist residency because it also allowed me to work in a uh, workshop environment. It's, it's like a dream workshop, basically, that an artist can dream of from any particular background, you know. I had uh, great experiences working with like very expensive machinery in there, made more physical experimentation and brought some of my digital ideas into physical with those uh, 3D printers, for instance, laser cutters, CNC machinery. Uh, so that, and also I had really great fellows uh, in that residency program coming from really different diverse backgrounds working with them was really cool also sharing our work supporting each other's work that was a very important uh period and uh yeah those th those two probably are like important turning points w when it comes to exhibitions and works i think like one of the turning points for me uh, was my first dome slash vr audiovisual piece called morphogenesis that i made in uh 2016 and developed it uh, through the years the interesting part about that work was it was my transition piece from projection mapping projection installation type of work into the m world of virtual reality and more immersive experiences understanding that 360 format 
allowed me to showcase that particular work in so many different places, uh, in geodesic structures, in VR headsets, also, you know, in digital prints and widescreen panoramas. That work allowed me to showcase in so many countries and cities. Uh, one of them is the Art Futura exhibition back in 2017 in Rome, uh, where we uh, exhibited this uh, panoramic version of Morphogenesis along with a few other uh, interactive pieces. Uh, I had the chance to showcase that work for four months in Rome. Understanding like digital media can go to so many places through just as a digital file without your being there or installing the work, uh, that really encouraged me to pursue more of a digital workflow and remote working. And that also changed my lifestyle, I think, understanding that can be done. I see. And I would like to give a special thanks to Moncho from Art Futura, who put us together in contact. I have uh, seen your work from the brochures of Art Futura, so I knew about you, and uh, he recommended me to talk to you about uh, becoming a new media artist and uh, the, uh, to get to know the ecosystem and present the knowledge to our community. So thank you very much, Moncho, and thank you very much, Art Futura, to put us together to make it happen. And the last part, I want to know a little bit about uh, what is the future as a new media artist? Because now with AI, with the whole world is different. Do you think there will be more and more just uh, new media artists just have a kind of a rush of blood to their head and say, I want to be a new yeah. media artist because I can. You know, it's like uh, now the amount of uh, self-publishing books uh, on Amazon is like, Oh, skyrocketing because now everyone can write with chat GPT, right? So how uh, would AI influence your career particularly? Every new technology that creates a paradigm shift creates new opportunities and ruins some other things, you know? It happens at the same time. But uh, I think it keeps us growing and innovating and challenging ourselves, ch challenging our understanding of human creativity and now maybe we're going to be computing with supercomputers or other things new technologies and 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 i think it's a good challenge you know we we got to keep fighting <laughs> for our own, our own species and our own imagination and hopefully uh, we're going to become even better creators through our uh, symbiotic relationship with technology so i don't want to really look at it like Oh, it's like it, this is the end now. Like we're, I I don't think so. I I think it might be the end for some folks who won't really uh, grow themselves or challenge themselves with with a new way of looking at technology and their art. I think it's gonna at the end require even more creativity and even more art uh, because that's gonna be the most precious thing a human being can uh, contribute to you know to the world through their imagination through their creations through their ideas uh, because uh i think in that frontier we can be ahead of the a ai because it only i mean machine learning it's great i mean it learns faster quicker broader than a human brain can work but at the end we're giving that input through our own ideas creations outputs you know uh, so uh, we can still be ahead of it and we can use it as a tool to produce even better work. Beside that, more specifically in my own art, generative AI for sure is very exciting and I'm very looking forward to where it's going to go. But the thing that I'm even more excited about is, is, is more related to spatial computing world uh, because I believe uh, we dealt too long in the world of 2D interfaces and 2D screens and the way we interact with digital world uh, in these, uh, you know, keyboards and mouse and, you know, touch displays and those things, I believe transition into a more uh, three-dimensional interface, a more spatial way of uh, interact with, interacting with digital space. And it's 
overlapping with our own vision and own physical space, I think that's going to be the new frontier and it's going to require a higher dimensional creativity to really utilize this new spatial world. And yeah, we, we see news of new gadgets coming for the future of spatial computing. And I'm excited to use those technologies when they're available and create with them. I like you mentioned one word is uh, when you talk about the artist cognitive ability, a cognitive space, landscape. I, I forgot the exact word. But... The, hor the horizon. Yeah, the cognitive yeah. horizon. The cognitive horizon, that's a word that really um, it kind of made me, uh -huh, made me think because it's true that a lot of our uh, abilities had been kind of grayed out because it's not within the cognitive horizon, there are limitations, but we can break those barriers and to activate and find our secret, you know, hidden creativity because I think creativity everyone has. It's just like muscles. You didn't right. exercise it and it didn't grow. How, how did you activate your cognitive horizon? I mean, personally, I, I was always interested in like psychology, neuroscience, physics, and like understanding the universe and human brain and, you know, all those things. So there, like beside art and technology, there is a personal growth and, you know, intellectual curiosity in, in that space. But it's intersection with my own discipline, you know, some of those like aha moments for me was uh, working with uh, projection mapping for the first time and seeing my work outside of screens and in the space uh, and to be able to manipulate the space you're in or the objects around you. That was a aha moment and epiphany for me. Um, because I thought, oh, wow, like th there, I, I see there is so many possibilities with this now. Uh, so that was the seed of my interest in how the relationship between these two worlds would go. Uh, another thing probably was when I tried the VR headset, uh, that, that was a moment of, oh, I see like, like we can do so many things with this. Like, this is amazing. And this is where the future of media needs to go uh, rather than larger and larger screens, you know, and, and hopefully at some point, you know, if there will be a technology that would directly communicate with our brains, you know, the human uh, computer interface, if it becomes possible. Uh, one of my uh, neuro, like uh, cognitive scientist teachers w wasn't really sure about the future of that because he believes that human brain is too complex for computers to be able to, you know, decode. But uh, all these recent developments uh, gives us some hope of that can really happen in the future if we don't uh, blow up the planet <laughs> before it. <laughs> the planet is fine. It's us yeah. who are the yeah. dying species. The planet didn't care, I guess. I mean, it didn't care about dinosaurs. And here we are, and they're like, oh, a new residence here. Let's repeat. <laughs> and we didn't learn nothing. huh? If we don't blow up ourselves, then right. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the brain and the body and the machine. That reminds me of Starlek, the, uh, the yeah. bionic. Uh, why didn't you go to that direction? Just a curiosity. Or did you? I think it's, it's far ahead in our future that uh, human brain uh, uh, computer interface it's far in the future i think for for a while at least a few decades we're still going to be dealing with sensors and screens and inputs of and those kind of interaction with the computer so i want to explore it imaginatively maybe as a concept in the work as a content but uh i think technologically focusing what is available and what is what is the closest what is closest to you i think it's a better way of managing your time because our time is limited 
totally agree. I remember that was the first in my class when I was studying film to use uh, HD, you know, 1080p. Uh, and I was struggling to edit a uh, documentary homework assignment and there, others were doing uh, SD and they finished their work and they're happy. And I was struggling, you know, all week and it took so long to render, to have any kind of, you know, subtitling kind of treatment. And finally, my work couldn't even be shown as, uh, you know, HD because the school computers are just, you know, projectors are showing SD. Yeah. So I feel like, okay, you know, the cost of to be ahead of your time is to waste right. your time. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> if you have the time, great. Yeah, you can t uh, test the borders, test the limits, but at certain points, it's not realistic. And you have to be realistic to say, okay, is it available? No. You know, can people read it, touch it, experience it? No. So it, I, I think that's kind of wisdom to know that. I think if you're wise, you may foresee that, oh, maybe it's going to take a few generations to get there. You know, maybe it's not something that I need to focus on right now. It doesn't mean that you need to be just realistic and just be you know not be uh, dreamy about your ideas but i think there is like a fine uh, fine balance in that you know uh, to really live your time or feel your time uh, is there any kind of advice you'd like to give to young artists today who is entering new media is there anything that i missed i didn't ask you or anything that's or spill some tea yeah <laughs> i can only say be courageous uh, and also have some sort of like self self criticism about yourself you know like be bold but also be cautious and uh, conscious of your intentions and your art at the same time you know do not afraid but don't become a uh, egoistic uh, ego yeah 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 let's say that at the <laughs> To always constantly uh, be self-aware, put a mirror up on the wall yeah. and look, you know. Self-awareness, yeah, that's the key, that's the key. Mm, yeah, self-assessment. But most people have inflated self-assessment. This is how our society is about, right? Fake it until you make it. This is how our society <laughs> yeah. is yeah. training the children to, to be. In terms of looking back at your career, what would you wish have done differently? talking about self-awareness and, you know, modesty and everything. I, I wouldn't change, change it so much because, you know, every experience led me to where I am right now, which I'm happy to be in, you know. Maybe I could just, uh, you know, when making some certain decisions, like, like life-changing decisions, maybe like quitting a job or quitting a relationship or things like that, you know, uh, I would advise myself to don't hesitate much you know because at the end it just becomes a waste of time you know just be quicker about those decisions you know that that would i mean that wouldn't change too much in my life but i would just save time and save the energy you know <laughs> yeah you wouldn't change the course of your career or your life but you would rather make it a little more efficient so you probably could have more time to make art yeah i think we have talked plenty, we've given some advice and some personal stories. So before finishing this video, I just want to give a big thanks to our patrons. We have a patron page and we have supporters who help me find time and to motivate me. And this is uh, um, the New Media Artist Talk. This is the, the very first with John. And then we'll be doing probably uh, more. So there are more videos to come. Uh, I will leave the link of John's uh, website, his YouTube channel in the description below. So you can also go there and check it out. Can also make interviews with other professionals in the industry. So you can learn plenty if you want to become a new media artist. Thank you, Mo. It's been a pleasure to meet you and, and thanks for inviting me to your podcast. This was a really fun conversation and I had a good time. Thank you. And I wish you the best with your upcoming shows. Same to you. Thank you very much for your time. Bye. Bye.